in the Serial Committee on Illegal Mining. While speaking exclusively to 3FM, Professor Boatin said he remains committed to the ongoing investigations. They did give you an indication of exactly the corruption or corruption-related activity that... Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, I cannot go over those questions now. Maybe I'm not supposed to do that. I don't know. They are doing the investigation, so I don't want to go into those details. But I want to a lot of questions, yes. Were you charged? No, I was not charged. And so it was just on the basis of that corruption or corruption-related... Investigation. Investigation. But now, this, this is coming out now that you have been... You, you were arrested and, and granted bail. Why do you think this is coming up now after this happened 16th May? I really don't know, but somebody called me and sent me a link that he read it from OSP online portal. Uh, I don't know whether that is true or not. I see, but was it in relation to this, these uh, excavators. They mentioned we go over a lot of topics, so including the missing. I, I will not mention any specific thing, but we went through a lot of things. But as I said, I'm not very sure whether I'm supposed to mention them or not because uh, records were taken and we have the records. And uh, the, the, they made, make reference to the details in the reports that was leaked. Your report? No, we didn't go over. I don't think we went over the reports that I wrote. I see. No. During that two-hour period, no. there was no reference to the. No, 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 no. Did the OSP give you an indication that you're going to be invited again? Well, they said if uh, if they did me, uh, they would invite me. This is what I was told. Have you seen this shoot as well by Captain Koda? I have seen it, and um, I've given my lawyers are dealing with it. Yes, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, it goes through the uh, internet, social media for a day or two before I'm set. That's Professor Frimpon Boati in that exclusive interview with my colleague Alfred Okanti. There's been quite a number of reactions to it. One of them from uh, Professor rather uh, mr peony uh who's been reacting uh, to it and we'll get a lot more for you on this because we've been joined on the telephone lines by governance expert professor bafo Dia is also a social commentator on a number of these uh, sort of matters many thanks prof for speaking to us uh, this afternoon and so the optics continue not to look good uh, following uh, the details of the arrest. What has been your thoughts on the way investigations have gone far, uh, so far? We're told this is not in relation to his report but work already being carried out in respect uh, to his time at the Interministerial Committee. Uh, yes. I think this uh, news has come as a big surprise to many of us especially those of us who know Professor Boatin personally, as I do, is a man of high integrity. He's a man who is totally committed to his country, to the well-being of his country. And I believe that when he's entrusted with any responsibility, he will do it uh, to his, uh, the best of his abilities. Regarding this specific case, we know he was chairing the interministerial committee to fight uh, Galamse, which is a big, big problem for the country. And uh, from what we know, he was tasked by his boss at the time, and his boss wasn't directly the president, but the chief of staff, to kind of report on the work that he's been entrusted to do on that committee and also to uh, suggest ways to strengthen the fight against Galamse. So the man did it as honestly as he could, and in the process mentioned some officials, both in the government and the, in the political party, uh, who are complicit in this uh, problem of Galamse. And of, of course, we know that the report itself was kept private until quite recently. And of course, when the report leaked, uh, all kinds of names became public. Then I think somehow he himself got invited uh, to the OSP, I think CID, where he was told back on May 16th that uh, he's 
is under arrest and that he's being investigated. And that's what has also become public uh, a day or so ago. Mm. So I think uh, he himself is very surprised that uh, he was called and was told that he was uh, under arrest. And in fact, he had to get someone to bail him to the sum of two million cities. And again, it didn't even end there. I think the officials accompanied him and his friends to make sure that the bail amount was reflected in the property that this person has. So it seemed like a very, very serious case. But, you know, I, 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 I really don't know. But when somebody is tasked to provide a report and he does an honest job and in the process, find some incriminating evidence and provide all this. Why hasn't the Office of Special Prosecutor invited those who are allegedly complicit in this criminal act of Galamse, mm. but rather the one who was asked to report? It's I know. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's looking, in your estimated opinion, that this is some form of a fight back under the guise of this arrest. Is that the case? Because that's the well, argument that's been made by I some. I think people can easily conclude on that. You see, when you look at the whole case, it's very easy for anyone to say, look, it's not just a fight back, but it's a victimization. That's how it looks. Because, as I said earlier, as you know, from Pom Boatin. <laughs> He's not a guy who will, uh, you know, get himself involved in this kind of thing. But you see, also have to say that if it's a matter of discretion or some judgment as a minister or as a chairman on these matters, those things, as a human being, you are heading a group, certainly there can be occasions of misjudgment and all. So if the accusation against him is that he had made some misjudgment, that one I won't quibble, I will not quibble for that. But to say that he himself is under investigation for corruption and misuse of items, that kind of stuff, that one is baffling. And I think mm. uh, the, the government is opening itself needlessly to uh, public attacks for victimizing someone who in the eye of the public is as innocent as a real child in these matters. Right then, Prof, I appreciate that you could speak to us. Welcome. That's Professor Balfour Jimendu, a governance expert, speaking to us this afternoon on that uh, detail which emerged yesterday, which we broke to you here on 3FM and on TV3 in relation to the arrest of former Environment Science and Technology Minister Professor uh, Frimpong Boateng. We're moving away from this to one of our top stories this afternoon, where pon pensioner bondholders have threatened to send the uh, Finance Ministry to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice should it fail to pay interest on their delayed principles. Government had delayed payment on their principles and interest over the last four months, that is between February and May, and the ministry, however, met with the bondholders early this morning to convince them to let go of the interest accrued. However, the pensioner bondholders have rejected the ministry's offer and have resumed picketing. My colleague, Judith Awachitando, uh, is there. We'll, we'll connect with her shortly. But here is the convener of the pensioner bondholders, Dr. Edwan Anientri, addressing the media after that meeting. The issue is that that is the money they are using to invest, to get interest, to buy their medication and spend for themselves. So if we have delayed it in some cases over 100, today one is 103 days. We are saying you can't get the money for free. Pay interest on it as we were paying when the, about the, the, the principal was free. So once we have not returned the principal, we are asking for payment of interest. Government say it cannot do that. We can't pay the interest. We have said that if government is not going to do that, we still want it to be done. So in that case, we will need an arbiter. So we have suggested that we will submit the matter to Shrak for Shrak to go into and tell us whether we have the right to take the defense, to demand the interest or not. So we have decided that we will do an official Elected government demanding the interest payment on the delay. The government is going to respond. That's 
Dr. Edwana Nienchi, Judith Awachitando, she's at the finance ministry. She's joined us on the telephone line. So, Judith, a threat to drunk the finance ministry to shroud. What more has the bond holders, uh, pensioner bond holders, been saying? Right, and so, Marina, apart from rejecting government's offer, government had on last Friday promised to pay their delayed coupons on that same day because of course when they were communicating with them they used the word immediately so of course they were expecting the money on that same friday even so um the pension bond holders had given them from that friday up until wednesday of this week that was yesterday to uh, fulfill their promise uh, uh failing which they would resume picketing but till now none of them have received any of the alerts and this is in fact very troubling for them and so today they resume picketing here at the finance ministry, right after the meeting, they resumed it and they said we're going to uh, continue picketing until government is able to pay their delayed coupons. So I spoke to one of the pensioner uh, bondholders and she has been recounting her ordeal. I owe this woman 60,000 CDs. That's how it has delayed, uh, affected me. She's my housekeeper. She bought treasury bills with her money. And I was an idiot and I bought government bonds. She, as soon as the, the, the uh, thing started 25th December, I told her, go and move your treasury bills. Now I owe her 60,000. I help people who are ill, my dependents. I can't buy their medication. She buys their medication. The 60,000 I owe her, she has been buying medication for her house, paying water bill, paying electric bill, buying food. This time we can't even give her money to go to market. Bread, everything she buys it for us. Six thousand cities i owe her where am i going to take it from you are giving us our money the money hasn't reached our pocket we have not reached our pocket this one is bright down quite joseph bright down quite he's in our house we are feeding him too come on they should come and bring us our money if they don't bring us our money thursday friday we'll come here those people who have just arrived from america imf they should be told we want our money what we gave is what we are taking we are not taking any haircut we are not taking any market value we are we are taking, uh, we are also issue exempt. We want our money. 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 We are taking our money. money. So, Judith, um, obviously not enthused individuals. Uh, did the finance ministry or officials from the, uh, by any chance, make any comment in relation to the non-payment still of their principles? Right, and so um, they had a closed-door meeting, and mm. so none of the authorities there at the finance speak to us but of course um according to the pensioner board holders they are saying that they are giving themselves a two-week ultimatum that is the finance ministry um that is that period within which they would use to pay their delayed uh, coupons but until then of course they have said that they're going to keep picketing here at the finance ministry they will come here tomorrow they'll come here next week thursday and friday that is if they are unable to pay their delayed principles and so that is what is happening currently here at the finance ministry right then judith our chitando my colleague uh there are the finance ministry with some more details for us we're taking you to us in north now because the former member of parliament there james jeche Quisin, says he isn't faced despite the governing new patriotic party picking a candidate from his hometown as Bruku. the npp yesterday elected charles opoku who hails from Quisin's hometown to represent them in the Asin north by elections but according to james jeche Quisin, he will not be intimidated by the move by the NPP. He's been speaking to my colleague Komla Kluche. Me, I would have bowed out already. This fight, or this struggle, all the frustrations, the challenges I've been going through in the last two years since I got sworn in, it's all about the people of Asenno. Whenever they remove their support for me, then my job is finished. But so long as they are behind me, I will not bow back. The fact of the matter is, in life, any time you are leading a cause for the interests of other people, unless you have been in that situation of mindset, you will not understand why people keep going forward. That's why we have the Mandelas, that's why we have the Kwame Krumas, and all these people. James Sachi question there. Well, the 2020 running mate to John Dramani Mahama says she has no doubt James Kwesin will win the Asin North seat for the NDC. She also spoke to Komla Kruche in Asin Breku. Well, is the NDC constrained that James Kwesin and the other candidate from the MPP are 
from the same town. It doesn't matter. It's how what you've done in your town. Unless we want to change the reason why we vote. It's what you've done. I also come from my village. I will not go and stand there. What, what is the confidence? What's the confidence that you have in them? I've talked with him a number of occasions prior to the 2020 elections. During the campaign I did, I visited some of the projects he was doing. I have followed everything he's done since then. Coming out of parliament, I've followed all of it. Even whilst he's at home, I've also seen what he has done. I have no doubt. No, he started doing this a long time before even contesting. He says he's on face with all the intimidation. You think he's been intimidated? That's what he's saying. What do you think? You know he's been intimidated. You know that. You're, you're so, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima there speaking to Komla Kruche, and he will join us on the telephone line pretty shortly uh, with some more details as he is currently based in the Asin North constituency as political activity continued to pick up. The NPP's parliamentary candidate elect Charles Opoku has also been speaking as well. He says that he's confident of snatching the seat from the NDC. Let's listen to exactly what he's been saying as well. <laughs> Charles Opoku there. He's become a subject uh, of contention between the Electoral Commission and the NDC, but we'll get a lot more if you stay with us here on 3FM 92.7. And still in the Asin North constituency, will interest you now that the Liberal Party of Ghana is claiming uh, making calculated efforts towards winning the Asin North seats in the upcoming by-election. There's currently ongoing efforts to sway the minds of some supporters of the NPP and the NDC to vote vote for the LPG to capture power. Komala Kruche has been engaging their parliamentary candidate Enyunam Sefenu on the strategies going forward. Although they didn't do well, but we are still on it. That's why we have taken my time to go to go around uh, saying not, making the people understand the more reasons why they should vote for me to come to power. What is your trump card? Oh... Um, so many other things. Oh. <laughs> what, what are you campaigning on? We are campaigning on how to, I mean, make the youth of our synod get what they want and then uh, 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 agriculture sectors also to also increase their productivity at our synod here. Yeah, that's our main motive here. You're confident you're going to win this? Yeah. How sure are you? Oh, I'm sure. You're not afraid of James Jachi Quason? You're not afraid of Charles Opoku of the MPP? No, I'm not afraid of anybody. And you know, I'm Sefenu there. Uh, she is the LPG's candidate. Uh, in the upcoming uh, elections, the by-elections there, and it continues to be an interesting watch in Asin North, and we'll be providing details for you here on your election command center. But you're listening to the news here on 3FM 92.7. We're streaming live on Facebook, our handles 3FM 927. Uh, same handles on Twitter as well, 3FM 927. Stories have been bringing to you this afternoon. Pensioner bondholders threatened to drag finance ministry to shroud. Should it fail to pay interest on their delivery? Late principles. We've been hearing from the convener of the group, Dr. Edwana Nientri, as well as another member of the pensioner bondholders group who have been expressing misgivings over government's failure even to pay them their matured coupons and bonds after assurances again last week. Also, the former Environment, Science and Technology Minister, Professor Bafour, uh, from Pomboate, I beg your pardon, he's described as strange his arrest by the police, uh, by the officer. 
Office of the Special Prosecutor over ongoing investigations into corruption and corruption-related activities of the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining. And we've been hearing from Professor Bafua Jimindia, who's a governance expert, and speaks quite a lot on matters relating to corruption. And he says that the government continues, uh, if it continues in this tangent, these investigations into the integrity of Professor Frimpon Boatin will only open the government up to a lot of criticism. Let's take you to Kumasi now, uh, the Ashanti region to be specific, where a man believed to be a member of the Obwasi Municipal Tax Force this morning prevented sister station on near TV's People Assembly program uh, currently being hosted in Obwasi. The disgruntled thug physically prevented the technical team from mounting live gadgets, claiming he was ordered from above to stop the event. Exactly what happened? Well, here's how it transpired. So just brief excerpt as to what happened. William Evans Sinkum has joined us on the telephone line now uh, for some details. Evans, talk to me exactly what happened. You were there. Well, so it was just a show of God standing, bravado, and then just unnecessary showboat. Um, this particular guy who has been identified as Alpha came to the grounds and started dismantling stuff. According to him, he had orders from above. But who is that person from above? He was unable to tell us. But I can tell you that for about three hours, there was a standstill. And he came with other two guys who were just throwing things about all, I mean, attempt to stop the program from happening. The police came in, and then um, they were asked to stop, but they also have none of that. I can tell you that it took some guys from the community to stop them. But I can tell you that, I mean, there's a stability now. The program is currently running. And when they said order from above, exactly what did they mean? They meant that somebody told them, a big man told them to come and then stop because we don't have the license or we don't have the permission to actually carry that particular program. That is the People's Forum mm. or I mean, People's Assembly. Right, Evans, just a bit more. Exactly where was the program happening? Is there a restricted government area? The program is, has been happening at the Obwasi in Sutem, I mean, very close to the prison. That is where the program is actually happened yesterday we were here had a very nice program i mean uh, people came in to share their opinions as far as development in obwasi was concerned we had an array of i mean political representatives from the various political parties also showing up so it was a very nice event yesterday people talking about what they think can be done in order to make obwasi i mean uh, experience some level of i mean developmental growth and what the view this morning was one would say a surprise package for the entire team, especially when this guy was, I mean, physically attacking our gadget. Right then, uh, Evans, uh, keep safe. We will return to you if there's more. That's William Evans Inkum in the Ashanti region for us, Obwasi, to be specific, where uh, some individuals attempted uh, stopping the live airing of the People Assembly by sister television station on the TV in Obwasi, Sutem, like you heard Evans describe. We're taking you just uh, a while back to the Asin North constituency because the development has been springing up there thick and fast. It's become a sub subject of a lot of debate as to if government uh, is not through these projects seeking to sway the minds of voters to vote for them with the springing up of development project roads and the likes. I mentioned that Kamala Kluche, a parliamentary affairs correspondent, he is in the Asin North constituency who just provided a lot more for us. Kamala, you've been in the constituency, uh, still quite massive uh, developmental projects being undertaken by the government, exactly how have the uh, residents there been reacting to all of it? Well, I mean, it's been mixed reactions coming from them. Uh, a lot of them think that, well, now the battle line has been drawn. They need to be able to look at issues in terms of uh, what both candidates uh, will will be bringing on board. Just a question at least, 
they've tested him, they know what he's capable of. Charles Opoku is also the new kid on the block. They they also need to look at him and see what the issues are. I just have some two gentlemen here briefly, maybe in about a minute or so, I'll pick up their thoughts. What is going to be your consideration going into this by-election? Going into, thank you very much for this opportunity. Going into this by-election, we are going to look out for competency. Is it considering the two candidates mm -hmm. that we have now? We have Chato Fuku representing the MPP and then uh, NDC who are planning to bring... Uh, Not the, they are planning. I, I mean, he, he's representing them. Yes. Uh, that he's your ousted MP. That is how I put it. Because now we don't even know whether they are bringing uh, uh, him on board. If he is coming on board, fine. We believe in what we have. We have a competent man called Charlie Cook, okay. who, who is on the ground. He is the man of the people. All right. The people are ready to uh, 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 bring him on board to make him the MP, the next MP. That's okay. I, 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 need, I need to run. Let me take the final one for you. For you, will the projects that are ongoing influence your decision? <coughs> yeah, definitely. The project will influence your yeah your decision. So you need you need a project, okay? Because the project was given to contract long time ago, okay. and they are, they were on it before this by a lesson. So it's not because of why did they stop? No, no, no. You see, no, those who are arguing that because of by election that the contract has been in the way. Contract can be done just in the three months or two months. Okay. It has to take a long process before it's done. Right. So once it's ongoing, it means that contract has been already secured. So that's why it's ongoing. Now, let's come to the potency or the efficiency of the two candidates who are contesting now. This Sasukoku was having an NGO, and the NGO has done a marvelous way for this particular. Yes, so, yes. I mean, it's quite obvious from where yes. you advance yes. the argument yes. Yes. that both of yes. you yes. are yes. for Charles yes. Sasukoku. Yes. Is that the yes. case? Yes. yes. Well, okay. And yes. the man can do the job. And so Many times, I preach. Okay. Many times appreciated. So, Mawena, it's right. a very views here and there, but uh, these two gentlemen, for them, they appear to be on the side of Charles Foucault. But if you speak to also a good number of them, at least, some that we have spoken to prior to this one, they've also been expressing the fact that, well, James should should continue it, even though he's outset, uh, he still stands the chance to be able to do this. Well, as to how he's going to find out, the decision is purely there to make come the day for the by-election. Right then, Kumla Kluche from us in North uh, speaking to us as we wrap up this afternoon's edition of the Bulletin and we're making way for business and the birthday girl is in uh, some style uh, walking into the studio and she's just going to be providing quick details as the International Monetary Fund team is in the country from today to the 15th as part of its regular engagement under the new 3 billion loan program. It comes after the approval was handed out to the Ghanaian government on may 17th uh okay just briefly on exactly what to expect with these engagements right so uh they are in town actually today so they're going to be in town from now 8th june to the 15th of june yesterday we we had some information that they were actually but the, the official meeting begins today with the ministry and i'm sure you know that government is preparing for the media budget review and it's it's one of the key reasons why the team is here to sit down with government and see the plan for the media budget review also to ensure that the conditionalities that the program seeks to find are uh, being met by the government so these are one of the, of the two things or one or two things that we should be looking forward to in the next few days all right then that's the birthday girl and aqr mensa brampa bringing us the very latest from the world of business just about now
A very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us on Business Daily. My name is Nanikia Mensa Brampa, and coming up this afternoon, Ghana Hotels Association threatens to picket at the Office of the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission, the PRC, over what it describes as insensitive water tariff increase. Also, the director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, Professor Peter Corte, has been commenting on these actions. We'll be giving you more details on that in the next uh, few minutes. Stay with us. Thank you for your time. Now, the Ghana Hotels Association is threatening to picket at the Office of the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission, the PRC, over what it describes as insensitive water tariff increase. The PRC, in a gazetted notice to the association, indicated its resolve to increase water tariffs by 150%. And speaking to three business, President of the Ghana Hotels Association, Dr. Edward Akanyamike, said the PRC should we consider the adjustments or members of the association will embark on a protest in two weeks? The commission cannot be trusted if the commission is being dishonest with a sensitive matter as tariffs and we allow it to pass. It means that tomorrow they can adjust water or electricity by any uh, percentage. And once they have done it, they have this time they say it's been gazetted. Once it's been gazetted, there's nothing you can do about it. They can do it. So we, we will eventually register our protest. If it means picketing at their office, we will plan to do that. But we want Ghanaians to know exactly what has gone on with this water tariff which we are not happy about at all because the initial announcement they made for first but was 8.3 percent adjustment which even though we didn't like it well we accepted it so when that 8.3 percent changes to 167 percent is it not deception it's clear deception and that was Dr. Edward Aka Nyamike, there he is, the president of the Ghana Hotels Association. And still on that matter, Professor Peter Corti, who is the director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, has cautioned industry players to be measured in their agitations against the tariff increases. Though Professor Peter Corti urged utility providers to adopt more efficient ways of operating to cut down wastage in the system. He also has admonished industry players to consider the dire consequences a crash in the system will have on their activities if utility companies are unable to generate enough revenue to keep the system running. We'll be giving you more detail to that. But Ghana may lose investors in the coming weeks as the United States puts in measures to tighten the monetary policy. Economist with the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Lord Mensah, has been engaging three business on the matter and says the impact on emerging economies like Ghana will be minimal. We are looking at um, investor community where they have alternatives. U.S. is one of the markets that they may target. If you, I mean, you have um, U.S. lifting its, I mean, policy rate, and obviously, interest rate structures within the economy is going to go up. So they're doing that because of, I mean, targeting the inflation that has gone up relatively for the past few months so high. And so we have two investors we're looking at. We have what we call the portfolio investors who invest directly to our market, our dollar denominated market. And so once, um, U.S. raise their policy rate, and they see that the premium that they're supposed to get for investing in our part of the world, especially Ghana, is not so rewarding, it will turn up to go and invest in the U.S. market. 
And that was Professor Lord Mensa. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School. Away from that, Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Samuel Abu Jinapo, has revealed a policy document as before Cabinet as part of efforts towards ensuring value addition in the exploitation of Ghana's green minerals at the Ghana Mining and Energy Summit 2023 in Accra. He noted the document will ensure lithium, bauxite, iron, among others, are not exported in the raw state. To ensure compliance with stringent environmental regulations, the protection of local communities, and the fair distribution of benefits, ours is a policy aimed at developing a mining sector that is socially inclusive, respects the rights of indigenous peoples, and contributes to the well-being of our citizens. That is why we have, since 2017, prioritized value addition and local content and local participation in the mining industry through policies such as the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation, GIADEC, and the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, GISDEC, and the progressive revision of our local procurement list. Indeed, as of today, we have before Cabinet for its consideration a policy on the green minerals of our country, which hopefully will jettison the age-old exportation of raw minerals in favor of value addition. And that was the Minister of Land and Natural Resources there. Just before we go, the CEO of B5 Plus Limited, Mukesh Takwani, is calling for active promotion of Made in Ghana products to ensure a revamping of the economy. Speaking at the Ghana Mining Energy Summit, he further called on businesses in the industry to ensure they deliberately increase local participation in their operations. Try to support Made in Ghana products. We can create a really very good synergy and energy, and that will be possible that with all of our synergy, let the money evolve right here within Ghana, and we can create a really a very big economy here. As you saw that we are producing a lot of uh, metal products, and we require the scrap. So this is my kind request to all mining industry and the capitals of other industry. If you are generating any type of scrap, we kindly request you that please sell it to be fabulous. We will come and pick it up from your place. We will clear. As Mr. Eric said, you are, and you pay for it. CEO of B5 Plus Limited, Mukesh Takwani, there, and gentle reminder that the International Monetary Fund, the IMF uh, staff team, are in town from today, Thursday, June 8th, through to June 15th, where they'll be sitting down with government to see the plan for uh, the media budget review to see how it falls in line with the conditionalities of the program so we'll be giving you more updates in our subsequent bulletins but do log on to 3news.com for more business news updates that's it for business this afternoon my name is nana ikia mensa abram enjoy your lunch black roster joins shortly thank you